see for this evening. So I've had a, uh, a great time, and it's my pleasure and honor to welcome everybody to the relaunch of Startup Tech Valley. Start up here a few years ago called Our News and started facing and showing you 
work to fight disinformation online. We were sponsored by a lot of the great local organizations, and we worked with a lot of companies, including uh, Facebook and South by Southwest. But unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, our news failed during the pandemic. There's no, uh, there's no, there's no pick me up to that story. Sometimes startups don't work out. <laughs> Uh, and there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. As an entrepreneurial community, we have to understand that 95% of startups fail. Yes, sir. So as an entrepreneur, what do you do? You pick up, you keep going, you keep looking for that next big idea. So for those who don't know me, again, my name is Richard Zach. I'm actually now a six-time entrepreneur. I do have two exits behind me. I'm an angel investor. I'm an advisor. And most recently, I was the global vice president for Canonical makers of Ubuntu Linux. We have our operating system on over 400 million devices that we have for of us. Uh, but once an entrepreneur, always an entrepreneur, and earlier this year, you know, I started thinking a lot about my life and what I've done and, uh, and where do I go from here, and I started doing some, uh, some thinking about the future. I finally went to, uh, uh, went to do some estate planning about my family and my future and what that might be. And I started getting stuck on a particular question. So a lot of times this happens for entrepreneurs. This is how ideas sometimes get started. And, uh, and the question I started asking myself is, well, what happens to my internet life when I pass away, right? That's kind of a little bit of a macabre question, but if you're thinking about your future and your children, you know, I've lived my whole life on the internet. Emails, files, social media, profiles, dating profiles, bank accounts, crypto assets. This has been going on for 25 years. Well, what happens to all that stuff? And I started asking myself this question. And what I found out was, basically, if you don't make arrangements for it, then nothing happens. Well, that can't be right. Something has to happen. So I kept digging and digging and digging and digging, and what I found, I started asking a deeper question. What's at stake if I just do nothing? The first thing I found out was really kind of crazy is that the first thing you lose in your online life is your privacy, because all the privacy laws, the GDPR, the CCPA, everything that protects your privacy in your life ends when you pass away. Every purchase you've ever made, every credit card transaction, all the data you've generated is no longer protected unless you close those profiles down. The next thing I discovered is that there are a lot of these online profiles that have value, whether it's eBay accounts, Etsy accounts, bank accounts, cryptocurrencies, NFTs, and otherwise. Otherwise, if these accounts aren't known, if people don't know how to get into them, that stuff just vanishes, and so a lot of money is actually lost by this. And then last, but certainly not least, is what ultimately fades away is, is, is the memories. The photos, the videos, the profiles, those, like, you gotta do something with them, or else they get slowly forgotten, and ultimately, you're only able to be found by whatever is indexed in Google, forever long they want to index it. So, what's the answer to all that? How do you fix this? Well, join us at the next event. <laughs> <laughs> where I'll be telling you a little bit more about my startup, Eternal Me. Thank you. This, is, uh, this event tonight is not about me, and I really want to keep the focus on uh, the community, on the, uh, on the people here at Browns, and on the great startups that are about to pitch and are about to introduce them right now. Uh, in the meantime, if you want to little, uh, learn a little more about Eternal Me, you're welcome to go to eternal.me. We're in a public beta right now. Sign up for a free account. Give me all the feedback. Love it, hate it, good, bad, everything. I appreciate that. But for tonight, um, I'm very pleased that we have some really great startups. We're about to come over and take up the stage. I'm not actually introducing the first one, but I'm going to pass the microphone off to Bobby. Thank you all very much. Stop. 
on Shop the Web platform to outfit themed short term rentals with thoughtfully curated collections of high impact furniture known to increase the rental value. Um, these guys are also um, clients of mine. I've had the pleasure of working with them, and uh, they bring upwards of 20 years of experience in this market. So, uh, without further ado, uh, I introduce uh, Jeff and Nick. summary 
Ethereum products, we then move right to your checkout. Your whole package is sent to your door. So this one, we have our clickable prototype done already, and this is the now roadmap that we're looking to do moving things into the future. So we have our clickable prototype now, the website development, um, then we'll move into the market testing with really users, brand partnerships, so that's finding people like Pottery Bar, or Restoration Hardware, someone who's willing to partner with us to take their in-place logistics products and everything like that into our business model, and also taking the invoicing, the logistics, fulfillment, getting the products to the customer, and getting the fully responsive website all the way to market. All right, there really isn't anything else out there like it. Um, an owner's investment in our curated theme collections will make them more money and secure more bookings. We'll work with quality, design-forward furniture companies that already have established logistics in place for dropshipping. And the market really can be anyone. It doesn't have to be short-term rentals. Um, we've initially targeted the short-term rental market, but we can expand beyond. Um, we're thinking the average homeowner can furnish their whole house if they'd like. Bachelor, bachelorette pads, college students, kit collections, retreat, office, hospitality, and beyond.
You just get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, when I've been to Airbnb, I've been to a lot of Airbnb. Yeah. Inside is usually pretty nice, but I've been to quite a few where the outside needed a lot of attention. I think, I think it's a great idea, and I think that that's where possibilities are endless, and the partnerships are endless. And of course, we can totally make that out of your partnership. Thin air. Well, 
This is what I do with every day. I have five monitors because I'm doing a lot of work, which sure many of you are, right? You probably have a monitor set up for many things you do. Well, there's a lot of people that face this, like financial traders, and you could go, the list goes on and on, video editors, but what thin air is, it's this idea of having an interface where you can zoom out and zoom in. And you can continue to zoom in, and you can continue to zoom in, and keep going until you know, it's endless, it's infinite. You can have as many of these browsers, these windows, all over the place, applications. You can leave documentation behind. And what it grows into is something like this, where you can be running a massive company, be working with everybody on your team, and everybody be collaborating in one computer. The way it works is the system actually runs on the cloud. So you can be running a $500 computer, have everything be promoted into, and be running on the highest quality hardware that you know, anywhere has to offer. So you can give your whole company $500 laptops and everybody can be running whatever it is that they need. And as a manager, you can see everybody and how they work in the system. And every day you go into it, you leave documentation behind. It gets better and better and better the more you use it. And it really becomes this living organism of your system. So what's the precedent for this? Well, there's other systems that do this, that use this infinite canvas, but they're all in the design space. They're all in the space of you know, places where you need collaboration and design. In the early 2000s, a book called The Humane Interface was written. It was actually written by the guy who invented the original Macintosh. Uh, his name is Jeff Raskin. And he was working on this idea until he died in 2004, and the idea actually died with him. So what makes a zooming interface? Well, the first thing is space. No more claustrophobia. You never run out of space. You just keep creating more and more objects, more windows, and just continue on your merry way and organize it how you think. There's a major piece of this where when you think of where did you put your car keys? You don't think that they're in this nested file structure. You think, oh, I put them up the stairs, to the left, in my bedroom, in the dresser, in the drawer next to my book. That's how we think. This enables you to think spatially within your computer. And then the Zoom and collaboration, the pieces that really separate it, this collaborative interface, anybody can be in there together and working together. No more screen sharing, no more saying, oh, it's that button, no, that button, oh, no, I meant this, and getting so frustrated with everybody around you because no one can communicate well. So the revenue generation, that we'll start with it being a three limited set of features that people will begin to use and love. And then when they need to expand because they're running out of space and resources, well then they expand to the professional version, which is most likely why people would use this. They're professional and need to be more productive. And then for your team, you expand into that, where all of a sudden now you're collaborating with your team, so we'll focus on small businesses and startups. And then finally, the enterprise level, where you can, instead of having to buy 3,000 MacBooks for everybody on your team that costs $3,000 a piece, we are duplicating hardware over and over and over again, and send everybody remotes into one singular supercomputer, so it's ultra secure as well as ultra effective. Now the target market, we're starting with innovators and early adopters, so students, small teams, and developers, because they're generally the first ones to start using new technologies. They have a real need and they're excited about it. They're ready to go for something new. Second piece is that we'll expand to small and medium-sized businesses, because they're always looking for operational efficiencies, and they're always trying to get better. And then finally, we'll expand into laptops, computers, and then any additional hardware that people need to continue on with the whole next phase of what we're seeing right now, which is the AI wave. There's never been a better time to rethink what a computer is than right now, because all of a sudden you get this massive shakeup of what it could be. So the timeline for this, I've been working on this very aggressively for over two years and building this system. You know, I have 10,000 hours at least of engineering complex systems. It's all I've ever done since graduating. And we're ready to launch, I'm ready to launch this thing, you know, very soon. I've had live things of it up, you know, and I've tried, I'm really at the point now where I understand what, how to break into it. it. There's a whole set of features that I don't have time to go through with that today in terms of like how to actually enter. But it goes a lot about if you can gain the developers and gain around the developer ecosystem and get them to want to build inside your system, well then you start having interesting apps that exist inside the system itself. And you know, we'll start by going in and having people build. Now, why me? You know, why this is a moonshot idea, right? You're thinking of, you know, how do you how do you get something like this to light? Well, you know, I built businesses before. Again, the first day I graduated from school, I had no idea what I was gonna do. And I said, okay, I'm gonna figure it out with my first girlfriend, or we're just gonna figure out how to make money, you know? And we did. We've grown our we built a corporate apparel business that puts logos and embroidery on t-shirts. And it supports this effort. It enables me to write code full time. Well, he now runs the business and he believes in what it is, so it works out great. And you know, th this isn't a hobby for me. You know, this is something I wake up every single morning and do every day. For anybody who's known me through RPI, this is all I ever did. I never did anything else. You know, I'm very committed to what this is. Um, and then finally, I've built a lot of complex software. I have a portfolio to back that up. I know how to build these systems, and I built this infinite canvas thing 
you know, 10 times over at this point with different iterations, making it better and better. So what's an easy goal? Right now, I'm looking to figure out how to add fuel to the fire, how to take a bucket of gasoline and just dump it on top of this idea. So I'm interested in having introductions to investors and speaking with them if they're interested in what this idea could be, because the potential scaling is really quite large. I'm also interested in meeting interested users, people who figure out how they use it themselves, because that's where I learned how to actually build the system. And then this is a QR code of a uh, splash page website. You can go in and join a mailing list as I start to, you know, we start to release this thing. And then uh, that's my contact info. And, uh, thank you, Dan, and this is uh, Finan. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so there'll be a hybrid of both, but definitely tailored towards consumption, um, especially in the age of AI, where there'll be a lot of features built in there. You know, a lot of compute, basically, the compute that you're using to pay for on top of a base subscription fee. And then follow up question, as far as like security and governance goes, um, I know the enterprises like really have to lock down the side of the teams, being able to buy into whatever it is. Um, how does security and permissioning work in that product? Yeah, absolutely. So all those applications that are running inside that cloud system, each one of them as a user clicks or interacts, they're passing through an ID that identifies them. So if you want to lock them out, you can lock them out. As well as if you want to run thin air on premises, very simple. It's designed to be something that's, again, it's duplicated in the cloud over and over again in order for it to exist. So it's a very simple thing to translate to an enterprise or say, hey, this is your thin air cloud. Do what you want with it. It's all locked down for you. Hi, so I might not have heard the question before, so this might be due. Tell me if it is. I am over here. Um, so, this is a really cool system. It's very new, um, much like, you know, MacBooks. A lot of people say, hey, you know, these are, it's a different type of system. It's basically impenetrable to hackers, and it's basically cyber secure. We all know that's not the case. So, what cyber security measures do you implement within your interfacing software itself to prevent vulnerabilities? Yeah, absolutely. Truthfully, it's much easier to lock down a system like this than it is most systems because there's really one way in and one way out. Whereas on most systems, there's ways in and out everywhere because they're so distributed. With this, it's designed such that it all sits behind one wall. So it's it's actually much, much simpler because you, you move one area in, one area out. So it's like, you know, it's like protecting a wall where there's one gate versus a wall where there's a hundred gates. So you're saying that it's a smaller surface area for attack? Absolutely. So, Uh, to communications professionals, 
founded in August 2023. The mission focuses on corporate communications teams. Uh, Market TQ is currently raising $600,000 in addition to the 550, uh, I believe, over 500, uh, raised in Q4 of 2023. I just got to meet this team just before uh, coming on, and they are fantastic. I think you will like them as much as I did. Market TQ.
a little bit like that. It's a little, a little cut off. But you can get it instantly within 30 seconds. You upload this, and now text, video, or audio is available to the AI. You've got some great feedback. Again, that's one of the core parts that I've learned as an entrepreneur for a while, is the feedback is critical, and you want to incorporate that and let them validate it. My co-founder, Dan, who's had quite some experience in this space, loves to say customers validate while we're trying to innovate. Uh, I think it holds true all the time. Right? So these are two snapshots from a beta client that uh, can't be named, as well as a actual client on the PR side. Those are powerful statements, we believe, right? With clients that can see value that for us help elevating, uh, driving what we're doing every single day. I probably don't need to uh, hammer statistics to anybody, but the communication world is exploding for voice. Um, Zooms again, uh, uh, Google Meets, right? Microsoft Teams, all of this is now part of our daily life. It's something that we know uh, will be with us. I don't think that's going to change. Telephones are another part of it. But this voice and digital communication explosion is all around us. We think if you can integrate this into what you do, we also aren't the only ones thinking about it. Uh, we've seen Microsoft Teams and Gans in the world do this. But using these software tools to make your communications better, we believe and we're pretty certain, right, can elevate everybody's game. It's an amazing team that's uh, partly local, right? So I think, again, seeing this turn out is fantastic. So we have local individuals involved, uh, from software engineering to the uh, sales front. We have some outside of the region, of course, but this digital team that can support what we're doing is fantastic. Um, and again, the fact that we're seeing more people locally uh, is, is amazing, honestly amazing. So this team has powered some very incredible launches tackling this market. So we're talking about for us, hundreds of billions of dollars are spent on productivity and collaboration tools. How can you make your um, Microsoft Teams communication better? How can you record your pre-sales fault? How can you make that CEO a little more aware of potentially evasive language they've used? All of that ties into, for us, a massive opportunity. <coughs> Our revenue is comprised of two pieces, so I'll try not to like, bore anyone on, on too many numbers. But it's important to think about, and especially if you're starting a company, I believe, that the world is moving a little bit more towards consumption. So we think about it for every time you're using software, we can actually uh, monetize it that way. So instead of charging a whole bunch up front, <coughs> making this an experience that's going to be like heavy for somebody, can we actually make it a little easier, a little less friction, a little more palatable? And that's what you're seeing right here. So it's a combination for us of revenue that can turn into a subscription long term, but if you actually want to just use this on demand, that for us is very important. Something that I think I'd be you know, remiss if I didn't say is given that this is uh, local, given the fact that we believe anyone can use this, we're looking at giving anyone in this room who contacts me or Dan, and my co founder over there in the next suit, uh, $500 in free credits for Market CQ. So it's an easy way for you to access it. You literally can just log in, you can upload anything you want, it's a secure environment and understand what we're talking about and experience the product itself. So that, for us, is where we are, right? We believe that raising more capital this year is critical. We want to get this out in the hands of people. Um, I personally love to see the local entrepreneurial uh, circuit and everybody involved uh, growing. So we're always available and, you know, like I said, we'll give free credits out to anybody who's interested. Thank you. So it's either for the teams prior to the call can actually upload information and get sort of like trained prior, or if we already take everything that happens, we, when we adjust it, like uh, process it, and then you can look at it after the fact. So real time, I think, is the next step, but right now it's yet pre-posted. Very cool, thank you. Thank you for another question. Yeah, Jeff. Uh, awesome presentation, you know, congrats on the traction to you, so cool to see like beta to customers, I, I love that. I'm, I'm curious, are you building 
AI, right? Like foundational horizontal AI that could be extended to other use cases, or are you taking maybe foundational models and building on top of them for this kind of vertical use case of financial services? And, and maybe walk me through the yeah. rationale of how you invest in those two dimensions. Yeah, that's a great question. So we have focused heavily on the integration part of this. So like we're not um, training foundational models uniquely. We're not trying to build them from, from scratch, essentially. But by looking at the content itself, which is an earnings call, we know that that gives us some scale. Like, well, what's it, what the audience that cares about it? So that gives us a little bit of a universe around it versus, I think, too narrow. Um, the other piece, too, which is how we can offer free credits, for instance, is the same technologies can actually apply to other accounts. So we can have like a generalization of how we add content specific, call it like prompt or fine tuning. But we're, I, I, I just got this question from somebody actually. We're, we're trying to focus on not going too deep on some of this. Because then it's almost like it's going so fast we're like unwinding it. We're trying to constantly think of a little bit of flex uh, more towards the generalization of the report. Smart. Makes sense. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Yes. Okay. 
go down a real thing here. Anyone play competitively online in a ranked, for like a, a ranked game like League of Legends? Yes. What do you play? <laughs> Call of Duty? Yes. So, as you know, when you play Call of Duty, you are playing against other people online who could be potentially anywhere in the world if they're on the same server as you. Uh, one last trivia question. Does anyone know the first commercially available console that was connected to the internet for online features like multiplayer that was available in the United States? You have the hand up fast. Sega Dreamcast? You are correct. The Sega Dreamcast, it came out in 1998 and was the first commercially available video game console for purchase at home that would connect to the players online. Interesting note is that Japan was way ahead of us. They had the Super Famicom by Nintendo that came out like eight or nine years before. Uh, you might also be thinking that you have the right answer with the Xbox or PlayStation 2. Those both were internet connected and had online multiplayer features in 2000. Um, so, with that said, um, what Wolfshaw Studios does is related to being connected to the internet to play video games. And with that, I'll pass it to Joey, our Director of Engineering, and we prepared this for, we're going to pass the clicker. Thank you, Clark. <laughs> cool, so what do we do at Wolfshaw Studios? Well, online gaming services, player engagement, and companion services. This is basically everything that Clark was mentioning. Uh, you want to play games with people online. We build and help people build services to support that. Uh, you can see here like a quick preview of some of the people we work with, but we're going to more detail in a little bit. So what does online game service mean? Uh, things like matchmaking, tournament engines, player profiles, voice and text chat, all the fun stuff that kind of lets you play games with other people. Um, we've also done some work on like coach integrations and other payment processing things. Um, in terms of like player engagement, right, we do a lot of um, cross-play progression, like analytics, stuff like that. If you ever buy a code in store and you scratch off the thing and you redeem it, right? That's code redemption. Uh, so I to build all that stuff. Um, so one thing about us is we're pretty technology agnostic. So we work with a whole bunch of different technologies, really whatever our clients are working with. Uh, up here is like a list of some of our favorites. But pretty much if you can think of any modern programming language, we've done something with it. Uh, it really just depends on the game. And with that, I'll hand it off to Chris to talk about some of our so yeah, just getting into some of the specifics. Uh, we're proud partners of Visual Concepts in 2K, working on NBA. Uh, we've worked on them for the past few years. So some things that we've done there are um, data flying or making the event system that they're using so other people can engage in them. Uh, just kind of making sure that they're module and they can be rolled out in a bunch of different ways. Uh, there's a couple other things that Please, our asks, um, 
Keep an eye out for uh, a Wolf Jam. That's our theme when we have any networking event out, uh, out and about. We call it a Wolf Jam. It's, we're very punny, Wolf Joe, Wolf Jam. Uh, but we're gonna have a happy hour in Troy in June. I sent these slides in last night, but we did confirm June 12th at Henry's Garden right across the street. If you wanna come hang out, we'll be posting about it on our LinkedIn. And like I said, keep an eye out for Wolf Jam Hackathon in November. Follow us on LinkedIn. There'll be a QR code in just a second that you can follow us. We're, we're getting super active on our LinkedIn and um, trying to do some positive posts like the Women of Wolf Jaw we did last month in March. Um, and as I said before, please be on the lookout for future engineering opportunities that will be available. Uh, we're hiring backend uh, online service engineers who might have an experience in Python, Go, um, C Sharp, C++, um, and our website, wolfchawstudios.com, has a career tab that is slash work at Wolf Chow. So thank you very much uh, for tuning in. Thanks for being here for the first Startup Tech Valley back after a way too long hiatus. Um, and I just want to thank everyone out here, including friends, previous coworkers, colleagues, um, and a couple uh, drinking buddies too. So <laughs> thank you guys so much. And if you're here, Any questions for us? Thank you, Sean. Yes. Um, what do you think of the new Fallout series? On the <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll be totally. Yes. So the question was, what do I think about the new Fallout series on Amazon Prime? Which is it is game related. It's a new uh, series on Amazon Prime that has to do with the Fallout series of video games made by Bethesda. Uh, Bethesda ZeniMax really big game publisher, Fallout was a huge, huge uh, title um, with multiple iterations. So the quick answer is, I have not watched it yet, but I have tagged it as favorite, and it's on my watch list. Um, I don't know, we have a Slack channel called Spoilers, and you write the name of the show, and then in a thread, you talk about it, and I know people are talking about it, so yes, please watch Fallout. Oh, actually, Sean, what do you think about it? Thumbs up, binary review one. <laughs> I think we might have time for one more question. And please make it harder. Yes. <laughs> Get anxious. Dusty. Okay. Uh, when it comes to like cheating, right? And forcing those kind of things, or you giving feedback to the producers, like what's your responsibility? What's your expectation of your responsibility for like, forcing that, fixing cheating, all that stuff? So we do some anti-cheat work. We can't really get into too many specifics, but it really is building tooling to like detect um, patterns that don't really match, right? Like normal player patterns, or maybe someone else I think is really good, like a different pattern. So there's a lot of different solutions to that, uh, but a lot of it is actually augmenting like human uh, reviews. So like flagging a session that might be might be a hacker or something, or might be a cheater, uh, raising that for someone.
partnering organizations in a big 518 and RPI, you know, frankly, but for RPI's work to launch and sustain this, we would not be here today. So just really big up. <laughs>